Hi, this is Dr. Ross, and this is the slideshow presentation of Reproductive Gross Anatomy as part of our Reproductive System Unit. This is for Dr. Camp and myself for our Anatomy and Physiology 2 class. So before we get started, let's talk about some really general thoughts on the reproductive system. First, what is the overall biological purpose of the reproductive system? And that is just propagation of species. Without reproduction, you don't get new members of a species. What is the biological evolutionary reason for sexual reproduction? And the answer there is genetic variation of the gene pool. Uh, organisms that produce sexually reproduce uh, organisms with new genetic combina combinations, uh, and this makes the species as a whole more resilient. So what are the four basic steps needed to accomplish this? First, we need production of gametes. Second, we need fertilization. Third, we need development. And fourth, we need birth. So let's talk about the parts that are needed to accomplish each, each of these major steps. So <clears throat> the organs that produce reproductive cells, the general term is the gonads. And in males, these are the testes. And in females, these are the ovaries. The organs that bring male and female cells together for fertilization. In males, this is going to be the penis, uh, as well as its plumbing and its associated glands. In females, this will be the vagina, the lumen of the uterus, and the uterine tubes. The organs that incubate the conceptus and deliver it when viable. In female, of course, this is the uterus and the birth canal, which is the vagina. Now, organs to help nourish, protect, train, and support the offspring. In females, this is going to include the mammary gland for breastfeeding, um, and, but it's also going to include both parents. So raising a human takes a long time, and it takes a lot of effort. So two parents are ideal. I'm not suggesting you can't do it with one, uh, but two will certainly make it easier. In fact, most mammalian species require both parents. So let's now move on to reproductive gross anatomy for male and female. When you complete this portion, you should be ready to move on to your labeling activities. So starting with the male, let's talk about some gross anatomy highlights. So structures that make the, the sperm, these are going to be the testes and the epididymis. The small muscles that affect the sperm production, the dartos and the cremaster. Uh, to me, this sounds like a monster truck name. The structures that nourish sperm, this is going to be the seminal vesicles, the prostate gland, and the bulbo-urethral gland. Structures that deliver sperm are the vas deferens, the ejaculatory duct, and the urethra. Uh, there are three parts to the urethra, and we'll talk about that later. The structures for intercourse, of course, are the penis and the parts thereof. Now moving on to the female, the structure that makes the egg is the ovary. The structure that supports the egg or conceptus is the uterine tubes and the uterus and parts thereof. Structures for intercourse in childbirth include the labia, the vulva, the vagina, the vaginal vestibule. So here are two images, uh, they're not particularly detailed, of the male and female uh, gross anatomy. Uh, the left image um, focuses mainly on the male external genitalia. It's not particularly detailed, but it's a good place to start. So this, uh, the external genitalia consists of the scrotum, uh, which of course encloses the testes, the urethra, and the penis. Uh, the penis is the erectile organ, and that can be further subdivided into the bulb, the root, the body and the glands. The image on the right shows um, shows the female <clears throat> reproductive anatomy. The main organs of the female reproductive system are the ovaries and the uterine tubes. Now the end of the uterine tube over here, uh, this that looks kind of like fingers, are um, um, are called the fimbriae, and this is where the egg enters. Uh, the uterine tube also has a section called the ampulla, which is over here along the side that I've circled with this purple circle. 
this kind of serves as a waiting area for the egg. Uh, the uterus uh, is another major portion and it can be further subdivided into the body uh, and the cervix or neck. Below the uterus is the vagina and not shown in this image um, <clears throat> is the, uh, external, the external genitalia. Now let's turn our attention uh, to the development of genitalia, starting with the left side of this slide, which shows the development of external genitals. Now this can be considered sort of in two stages, the top stage shown here uh, in the bottom stage. The top is the indifferent stage, and this is where if you compared a male and female, you would not dif you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between their genitals. Uh, as you move into the later stages, we start to see clear differences between our male and female. So in the indifferent stage, you have the development of the genital fold. You also have genital swelling and an increase in the size of the genital tubercle. Now, in the presence of dihydroxytestosterone, or DHT, which is uh, made from testosterone and is much more potent, um, the genitals will um, start to differentiate into male genitals. There is a rapid elongation of the genital tubercle, which becomes the penis. Uh, the urethral folds form the body of the penis, and you can see that down in the bottom um, of that image. Uh, the folds close over by the fourth month, uh, forming the penile urethra, and then ultimately those genital swellings will become the scrotal swellings, uh, move caudally, and form the scrotum. Now in the absence of DHT and in the presence of estrogens in the female embryo, female genitals will develop. The genital tubercle will elongate slightly to form the uh, clitoris. The urethral folds and genital swellings don't fuse, but instead form the labia minora and labia majora. The urogenital groove uh, will remain open as well, forming the vestibule uh, into which the urethra and vagina will open. On the right side here, we see the internal um, reproductive organs and at the top is again the indifferent stage where we would have the same structures present in both male and female embryos. Now if the Y chromosome is present, the SRY gene will be there, it will be expressed, and certain things will change. So those gonadal ridges that are those yellow ovals in the top structure will eventually become the testes, um, the mesonephric and uh, paromesonephric ducts will also change. Uh, one will degrade, the other will become the dectus deferens, and ultimately we will develop internal reproductive male anatomy. Now if the Y chromosome is uh, absent, SRY is not expressed, and um, we have slightly different um, occurrences. So in this case, uh, the paramesonephric duct is going to form the uterine tube. Uh, the mesonephric duct will degrade uh, instead or degenerate. Uh, the fused para, um, parames paramesonephric ducts will also fuse and form the uterus um, and the urinary bladder will ultimately move to the side. Um, uh, the point being we're ultimately due to expression of this one gene we're going to see um, differences in the internal reproductive organs. So now I'd like to turn our attention back to the male reproductive organs and talk about the movement of sperm through the, or, uh, the male reproductive organs, or what we like to call instead Mr. Sperm's Wild Ride. So let's get started. We start with immature spermatozoa, and they are made in the seminiferous tubules of the testes. They are collected in the ret testis and move into the epididymis to, to mature for two to four weeks. So initially they lack the ability to swim forward. Uh, so during their transit in the epididymis, the sperm undergo a maturation process um, necessary for them to acquire motility and uh, hence the ability to fertilize the egg. So once the mature sperm begin their journey outward after that two to four weeks, they will go to the vas ductus or the vas deferens or ductus deferens. They'll pass behind the bladder um, and pass by the seminal vesicles. 
The seminal vesicles will contribute about two-thirds of the total seminal fluid. They add a fluorescent yellow liquid. They add citrate and fructose. So uh, we like to call this the high fructose sperm syrup. Come on, guys, you know that was funny. Uh, the seminal vesicles will also uh, contribute prostaglandins, which will help dilate the cervix and a set of molecules that coagulate, or if you want to use the technical term, stickify the semen. Um, I want to point out again before I move on that the prostaglandins are actually not made in the prostate. So next, the sperm and semen are going to flow into the ejaculatory duct. Uh, so in the ejaculatory duct we are, the sperm will now pass through the prostate gland. This gland contributes the other one-third of the seminal fluid, adding mucin and more nutrients, um, activating enzymes, including PSA. So PSA is a good uh, marker for prostate enlargement, so uh, as men age, this will be assessed uh, in their blood. The prostate gland will also contribute, um, as part of that fluid, an antibiotic called seminal plasmid. And this is important because we have no, inter uh, no interaction with the immune system here. Um, the immune system could actually damage the sperm. Uh, so it's important to keep um, them free from any kind of bacteria. So an antibiotic uh, is present to keep the, um, the seminal fluid clean. The bulbourethral glands are next. So this is at the bulb of the penis. The bulbourethral glands will prepare the way with alkaline mucus, uh, and this is gonna neutralize any leftover urine acids. Uh, remember, um, um, there could have been urine previously in the same passageway, and you want that to be uh, neutralized. Um, it's also going to lubricate the gland's penis for intercourse. Finally, the sperm pass through three parts of the urethra, the prostatic urethra, the membranous urethra, and the spongy or penile urethra. Eventually, they will exit through the external urethral orifice. And that ends our wild ride by Mr. Sperm. So now let's trace conception. So we're going to start with the female this time. So an oocyte is released from the ovarian follicle, and it gets pulled into the fimbriae by the beating action of cilia. Uh, then it gets wafted down the uterine tube to a waiting room called the ampulla. Remember, I pointed that out. It's a particular area of the uterine tube. While it waits, um, one male pronucleus will enter, and the egg will finally complete meiosis. Um, three polar bodies. So remember, meiosis creates four haploid cells. So three of those polar bodies are going to be ejected. Only one will remain. Uh, the female and male pronuclei will fuse, and the fertilized egg will now be considered a zygote. Now, <clears throat> while it waits, we have the male contribution occurring. So many spermatozoa are going to enter the vagina and swim through the cervical canal, the body of the uterus, and finally the uterine tube, um, getting up to that ampulla. If all goes well, one will encounter the egg. Uh, the acrosome of the sperm will release enzymes, which help it get into the egg, and the pronucleus then enters the oocyte, and we have fertilization. And that is it for this presentation.